To watch all of my exclusive content not featured here on my channel, log on to my website at I'm just here to make you think.com slash films. Continuing where we left off during the second part of this segment, we begin with sharing more details on how this system was designed to benefit only 1% of the people. These ideas of colonization were originally experimented on other people outside of the Americas and carried over to these lands with a more desperate need to succeed at monopolizing an already existing form of trade here. It was said that whoever controls the trade controls the land, and with the creation of currency, the use of shares, stocks and bonds, along with the implementation of economics and exchange, the Negro farmers would soon lose control of the trade here in the US, and subsequently, they also lost control over their lands with the help of the banks. A bank is defined as a retail or commercial financial institution that is licensed by the government to receive and loan money. The word bank derives from the old Italian word banca and then the middle French word ben banque, in which both words are defined as a table, which is why the etymology of the word bank is defined as a money lender's exchange table or a money box. The term money box was the obsolete sense of the original meaning for the word stock, which also meant a subscribed capital of a corporation. In other words, stock was the term used to describe the movable property of a farm. Now, some of you may feel as though this is in regards to the animals on the farm, like livestock, for example, but unfortunately, it also holds true to the other movable objects on the farm as well, like those that work on the farm, who were also labeled as stock and kept account of. To be kept in stock meant to be kept in possession of a traitor or to be in prison, prisoners of war. And here's why. Paper currency had oftentimes been hard to come by during its earlier days of existence due to the bartering system being widely recognized. Many of the Negro farmers were making purchases literally off of promises, and because certain crops only came once a year, there was a credit system that was used to where things could be purchased all year round, and the money would be paid through the sale of the crop when it was ready to be purchased. Whenever the crop received was lower than expected, or if it was sold for less than it should have been, the farmer would then fall behind on his or her credit, and this invincible amount of currency owed would be tacked onto next year's amount due. After so many times of this happening, the Negro farmers will be then forced to either get a loan or to sell their farm. What is also very important to note is that in the 1860s was something called the crop lien system, where the farmer would sign over the deed to their farm and still be able to work on the farm to pay it off. However, with the rise of taxes, transportation costs and storage fees, etc., this became very difficult to do so, which eventually led to foreclosure, allowing for the banks to now own our ancestors' lands. With the Preemption Act of 1841 already set in stone, the tenant farmers that were squatting on the farms and sharecropping with the Negro farmers were given first dibs on purchasing the lands, and in many cases, for free. Now, some of you may feel as though this sounds like a fair deal, but what if I told you that these same tenant farmers were already expecting for things to happen the way they did? 
After being in office for only three months as the Vice President of the United States, Andrew Johnson, a racist, bigoted Democrat, became the president immediately after President Abraham Lincoln's assassination. Johnson was also the military governor of the very first state to re-enter the Union after the Civil War, which was the state of Tennessee in the year of 1866. Now, according to WhiteHouse.gov, he used the state of Tennessee as a laboratory for reconstruction. So it's no surprise that also in 1866, Johnson sent out a U.S. Department of Agriculture official named Oliver Hudson Kelly in order to survey the South and the agricultural industry as it was right after the Civil War. And after this survey, Oliver Hudson Kelly responded with the creation of a secret society very similar to the Masons, but this secret society was formed off of the industry of agriculture. So, with the help of five politicians and a banker, Oliver Kelly founded the National Grange of the Order of Patrons of Husbandry in 1867. Grange is an old French word that means granary, barn, or farm. And the term husbandry is defined as someone that manages the conversation of resources, which meant that they were fully intending to take ownership of these farms from the creation of this society. Side note, the etymology of the word bond defines it as a husbandman or householder. The National Grange movement that was said to have been created in order to increase farm profits for farmers unite southern and northern farmers, create co-ops for farmers, and to modernize farming practices. But the Negro farmers were banned from joining this movement. The National Grain supported the efforts of politicians and advanced several political candidates that were a part of the Greenback Party that allegedly carried an anti-monopoly ideology. The movement encouraged the distribution of greenbacks and worked diligently in order to remove the middleman out of the farming industry, who were the Negro farmers, by playing a key role with the establishment of the farm credit system. In the year 1916, then President Woodrow Wilson and his administration established what is called the FLB, also known as the Federal Land Bank which is a system of banks that aided farmers in rural communities. Rural is another way of saying open space or open land or country. President Woodrow Wilson's main focus was to enforce a new era in business upon all business entities throughout North America by making drastic changes to the economy by federalizing all operations concerning the trade. The Federal Land Bank consisted of a total of 13 banks, not 12. Listen closely. Originally, before the Confederate States separated from the Union, the foreigners called these lands the 13 colonies, and soon after these rural areas were sectioned off and underlined as estates, various laws were passed, allowing each estate to have jurisdiction over their government-appointed district. Each Federal Reserve District had its own Federal Reserve Bank, and at the time of its inception, there was a grand total of 13 districts, making it a grand total of 13 banks. So who was this 13th district that somehow people would overlook? It is the stateless area known today as the District of Columbia, under strict control of the US Congress. More about this in another segment, but I mentioned all of this for a very particular reason. On December 23rd, 1913, three years prior to the creation of the FLB, President Wilson signed the Owen Glass Federal Reserve Act, or rather known as the Currency Bill, into law. This allowed for all major European powers to develop centralized control over all banks in the United States and forced only one form of currency to be lawful, which was the Federal Reserve Note. 
This was a much more modified version of the original Currency Act of September 1st, 1764. This means that all banks in the United States were now controlled by foreign entities, and these foreign entities were rather known as private banks. And these private banks collected interest on monies borrowed, or rather floating debt, by the U.S. federal government. Taxes should ring a bell here. Now, I want you all to note that these foreign entities or private banks do not own any individual banks of the United States, but they do own, however, stock in those same banks or shares, and only member banks can hold those shares. According to the Federal Reserve Public Records, about 38% of the banks in the United States are members of the Federal Reserve, and due to the currency bill signed by Woodrow Wilson, member banks must purchase shares based on their size alone. So the biggest banks would have the most shares, which would be Citigroup, JP Morgan, and Bank of America. And the largest stockholders of the banks that own shares are Barclays, Capital Research and Management, AXA, Bank of America, Fidelity Management and Research, State Street Corporation, Lazard Asset Management, Morgan Stanley, James Demon, and Sanford Wheel. As the process of converting all promissory notes to Federal Reserve notes were currently underway, President Woodrow Wilson was quoted stating the following while campaigning his new agenda. Banks all over the country hastened to enter the Federal Reserve System encouraging even congressional leaders to enact a new banking system and currency reform. Also, during the year of 1916, another piece of the banking and currency reform plan was underway, which eventually merged the 13 Federal Reserve banks that made up the Federal Land Bank with other banks alike and service corporations. When the merge was completed, it became known as the Farm Credit System, a now fully government-sponsored enterprise, or GSE for short, that still operates as a network of banks that provides lending services to beginning farmers, rural home buyers, agricultural producers, and rural infrastructure providers today. In addition to all of that, they also provide loans or credit for the commercial aspects of rural land, banks within the farm credit bank only, and deals with refinancing, restructuring, rebuilding, and the repurchase of rural real estate for personal use. Let's break down each branch of this farm credit system first. There are nine farm credit system institution types, which are Agricultural Credit Association, Bank for Cooperatives, Farm Credit Bank, FCS Financial Assistance Corporation, Federal Intermediate Credit Bank, Federal Land Bank, Federal Land Bank Association, Federal Land Credit Association, and Production Credit Association. These institutions are direct lending associations affiliated with one of the four banks of the farm credit system, who are CoBank, Ag First, AgriBank, and Texas. There are six service corporations performing duties under the farm credit system as well, who are the Farm Credit Foundations, Farm Credit Leasing Services Corporation, Federal Agricultural Mortgage Corporation, Federal Farm Credit Banks Funding Corporation, Advantis Incorporated, and Farm Credit Financial Partners Incorporated. This is just scratching the surface of who should be held responsible for the mistreatment of our ancestors, confiscation of our ancestors' lands, along with broken promises that were never upheld by those who created them. Another great example of how this capitalist society succeeded in popularizing industrialization for one's loss and another one's gain is America's most highly favored board game called Monopoly. On January 5th, 1904, a board game called the Landlord's Game was patented under inventor Lizzie J. Maggie, 
also known as Elizabeth Maggie Phillips, who was the hidden figure behind the idea of the Monopoly board game. As you may recall, that each time this game is played with your family or friends, things will take a turn for the worst near the conclusion of the game. Arguments, long periods of not speaking with each other, possible relationship separations, and so forth, right? Well, that's all due to the fact that this board game was never meant to be a fun, family-friendly type of game. In fact, it's a game of reality. A reality of how this society was established from its inception. Fraud. In a 1936 magazine article of the Evening Star, Elizabeth Maggie noted that the game was to be, quote, a practical demonstration of the present system of land grabbing with all its usual outcomes and consequences, end quote. Author Ruth Hall wrote that the term land grabbing, quote, obscures vast differences in the legality, structure, and outcomes of commercial land deals and deflects attention from the roles of domestic elites and governments as partners, intermediaries, and beneficiaries. According to the Webster's Dictionary, the noun land grab means, quote, a usually swift acquisition of property such as land or patent rights, often by fraud or force." End quote. This is not just some simple board game, as it does, however, expose the duplicities of a federal currency system and the malevolent implications of capital accumulation by taking land and building an empire from the labors of those who were cheated our ancestors. I'm just here to make you think.